by Foundations of Writing on the Academic Agency. To write clearly will help you to think clearly. The ability to communicate ideas in lucid prose is foundational to success in many areas, and it is a basic requirement in every walk of life. You will learn the parts of speech and come to understand the core functions of the English language, sentence construction and syntax, punctuation, style, and common mistakes. Once you see how mistakes are made, you will not unsee them. You will know for the rest of your life. Foundations of Writing. Buy it now. The liberal democracies in which we live in the West, as we know, tend to swim leftwards, regardless of what the masses happen to believe. Elite opinion is on a permanent left-wing trajectory towards ever greater progressivism and globalism. However, right-wing sentiments in the masses, so-called populism, serve as a danger to the liberal democratic system. There are several inbuilt mechanisms to contain this. I would like to consider two in this video. First, the mindset of the Tory boy, the first layer of right-wing containment, and second, the mindset of counter-jihad, which is the system's last line of defence. The mask and the face of containment, you could say, but actually both variants of exactly the same thing. To consider the Tory boy first, let us consider an exchange I had today on Twitter with the Tory boys, six men who live on a diet of almost pure cope. I would ask you to look past the individuals involved and rather to see the worldview behind their thinking. Let us tease out what they are appealing to in making the arguments uh, that they have made. It started when I pointed out to Easter Gammon worshipper, the head of the Tory boys, who spends a lot of his time on Twitter championing the royal family, and especially Prince William and Kate Middleton, that his hero has been telling Afghan refugees that they couldn't be more welcome here. And let's have a look at his initial reply. He says, one, Prince William is not in control of our immigration system. Two, these are not illegals. Three, now they are here, the only option is to be nice and pleasant. Number four, what do you expect him to say? Start ranting at them like Mark Collette or Tommy Robinson? Truly, there is nothing the Tory boy won't do, not to bend over backwards to excuse the establishment. Of course, the only alternative to fawning over the acceptance of foreigners in his mind is, quote, Tommy Robinson or Mark Collette. And a bit more on that later. This is your mind on mainstream values. But notice that implicit in his worldview here is a note of defeat. Ideally, we wouldn't be taking in lots of refugees, but they are here, so we might as well accept it. In any case, what's a man like Prince William supposed to do, apart from to grin and bear it and welcome them with open arms? He continues, he is the future king, not a right-wing activist or politician. These Afghans will eventually be his subjects, so of course he will be welcoming. This is the decent thing for a future king to do, regardless whether we think they should be here in the first place or not. So now it's beyond just defeatism and pragmatism. It's actually a virtue that Prince William is doing this, and that's a good thing as a liberal centrist might say. So now we have to entertain the fiction that these Afghanis are going to become lovers of the monarchy. Maybe they'll be like the best of British, the Siddiqui family from off of Gogglebox or another of Eastern Gammon worshippers heroes, based Preeti Patel. Three lines on a shirt, jewels remain still gleaming. I mean, God, it makes you so proud, doesn't it? That's what it's all about, eh? Our, our boys out there giving it their all. Our three lions, they're the real winners. And maybe one day, also Ali or Mohammed will be there singing along on the terraces because, you know, Bobby Moore means so much to him. And when Lineker scored, Bobby belting the ball and Nobby dancing. It's like the Tory boy dream is to turn these fine fellows you see on the screen here into an Afghan version of North FC. 
you know, Abdal Al Karim is going to love it when he finally gets to go to Greg's and maybe have a cheese pasty. Maybe he'll get himself a commemorative plate of King William from the back of the Radio Times. Or he too can glory in what it means to be British, doing the Mobot and draping himself in the Union Jack. Maybe he too can get himself some good old-fashioned British values by eating a tin of shortbread while he's at it. Naturally, the sheer absurdity of this worldview cannot be defended on its own merits, and thus the Tory boys needed to change tack. So what could they appeal to instead of defending their biscuit tin traditionalist nonsense? Easter gammon worshipper naturally called in the rock steady and bebob of Tory Twitter, the dumb and dumber, the Tweedledee and Tweedledum, Vanishing Point and Lord Urquhart. They came crashing in to save their master. And naturally, they thought they could zero in on the fact that I'm half Iranian as a kind of gotcha. Vanishing Point said, Immigrant, angry about immigrants and the erosion of indigenous culture. Urquhart chimed in. AA is more Iranian in his worldview than he is British, 100%. Vanishing Point went even further. Things Iranians hate. Churchill for invading Iran in 1941. Communists for invading Iran in 1941. Attlee for the Abadan crisis of 1951. Anything Israeli. 1945 onwards. Things Iranians like. Making transsexuals. And the ball was rolling now. You could see Urquhart was gaining confidence. He was in his element here. And so he came back again. He says, your ideology, he's talking to me, your ideology is foreign and needs to be stepped over. You have more in common with mid-century Germany than anything that's ever existed in Britain. Finally, a chance for these clowns to engage in some uh, allowable racism, a nice big dollop of allowable racism that the Tory boys can lap up. Iran, I mean, that's got to be an acceptable target, right? Time to hammer AA for his foreign blood and for his foreign ways of thinking, his foreign ideas and so on. And yet, let us recall what all of this was in defense of again. All oh, right. Remember Prince William welcoming Afghan refugees? Now, you know, if someone who was born and brought up in Wales, who grew up in the cultural quagmire of the 1980s and 1990s, graduating from He-Man and Thundercats to queer as folk and Eurotrash, is actually too foreign to listen to, then what hope do we have of ever integrating our newest British brothers here? And thus the Tory boys unwittingly expose the key flaw in their mindset. When push comes to shove, when you get beyond the naive appeals to bulldog nationalism and biscuit tin traditionalism, under the surface lurks an appeal to something else, and something which can only manifest itself as a kind of low IQ nativism, a bankrupt racism that imagines that a drop of Iranian blood transforms you into a lunatic or fanatic. And yet, the irony is that if you ever point out to these people one group who does persistently act in their own interests, one group that does persistently demonstrate overwhelming in-group preference, well, that makes you the second coming of Mustache Man. I mean, after all, that just isn't British, is it? It goes against uh, Judeo-Christian values. So let's recount. The Tory boy feels safe defending Prince William welcoming refugees. He feels safe demonising Iranians. But he doesn't feel safe if anybody points out who owns the media. There is a deeper facet of their thinking revealed in this, however, which is... At its heart, the fact that they are scared of the Afghan refugee. They are scared of the other, who 
they do not really wish to welcome when all is said and done. Yet, paradoxically, they are forced to accept and defend this welcoming. The cowardice of the Tory boy is total, and thus he is forever in such a double bind. But note that the mask of the Tory boy is defending Prince William's welcoming of Afghan refugees. But the face of the Tory boy, uh, this is when they go on the offensive, is revealed against the vile Iranian outsider. And thus we come to the last line of defense in the system. When Tory containment can no longer work, the regime has one last trick up its sleeve. And this is what we call counter-jihad, what you might call the Katie Hopkins grift. Now, before we continue, it's worth pointing out that even though counter-jihad is nominally to the right of the Tory boy and will likely be disavowed by the Tory boy, as we saw Easter gammon worshipper disavowing Tommy Robinson earlier on, in actuality, as revealed by the attack on Iranians per se, in the final analysis, they actually share the assumptions of counter-jihad. They are just more genteel about it. When the system wants to, such as under George W. Bush and Tony Blair, it can even lean into this in a more mainstream way. It spent about a decade programming young men to believe that Islam was the enemy across media and in video games. Now, I have identified eight general features of counter-jihad that I'd like, to, uh, I'd like you to become aware of and to look out for. Number one is violent and ugly rhetoric that does often cross the line into very obvious bigotry and gives the left justifiable uh, talking points, you know, justifiable outrage um, that they can then fill up their own column inches with. This is designed to get the base, the right wing base, excited because the rhetoric has been turned up to 11 and this will upset the regime and this in turn establishes their credentials the counter jihadists credentials as being quote based on right wing almost the more over the top they can be the better since it serves as a point for the left wing to demonize and paint the right as low iq grugs and it serves as a point for said low IQ grugs to provide evidence that they are not stooges of the mainstream. Now, the second feature of counter jihad is, of course, overwhelming focus on Islam as the source of the problem. This is a low key acceptable target, as I've already discussed, because while the charge of Islamophobia will come from the left, this has much less purchase in the general populace as compared with, say, anti-Semitism. Vanishing Point, for example, who was so happy to generalize about the 84 million or so Iranians around the world, would nearly have a stroke if you dared do the same thing about the 15 or so million Jewish people in the world. Or just if you happen to point out that this group happened to over-index in certain areas, the regime tells him that it's okay to demonize Iranians, but his mind simply will not allow himself to look at that other group because that would just be beyond the pale. That makes you literally Hitler. Third, a general flanking of Islam from the left by pointing out its issues with women's rights, with gay rights, LGBT, etc., etc., now, this is an extremely common tactic employed by virtually everyone from the more daring Tory MP to Paul Joseph Watson. What it tells you is that their core values are liberal and not reactionary. But beyond that, it tells you that they have not thought seriously about the core reasons for the malaise of the West. Fourth, there is the mysterious and undying love for Israel. Now, I'm not sure if I need to say anything more than this. It is simply a persistent feature of groups centered around counter-jihad, 
for reasons you will have to uh, investigate for yourselves. Fifth, there is the studious funneling of the issue into being one of cultural heritage alone, generally downplaying racial elements. It's important for counter-jihad to establish the issue is with Islam per se as an ideology, as an idea. There is nothing racial motivating what has been going on in the West beyond that. I'd suggest that this narrative is more difficult to maintain in 2021 than it was in 2015, but I also find it interesting that we are now seeing a resurgence of counter-jihad in both uh, Britain on GB News and in France with the upcoming election. It actually tells me that the system is fighting a rearguard action against what it perceives to be more dangerous sentiments uh, bubbling up in the population. Number six, appeal to either bulldog nationalism or biscuit tin traditionalism. These two elements of control, <clears throat> on the one hand, appeal to World War II myths, um, and on the other hand, branded safe versions of what it means to be, quote, British or French or American or whatever else on the other. And these... Uh, Myths are very powerful. We saw uh, Lord Urquhart utilize it earlier when he suggested that my ideas are, quote, not British and are somehow, quote, German. But what does he mean when he says this? At root, all he's really talking about is basic pattern recognition. The idea that British people have always been unable to do this is nonsensical. The Tory boys and counter-jihadists alike worship the figure of Sir Winston Churchill, the patron saint of bulldog nationalism. Now, one of Churchill's favourite historians was a chap called Sir Arthur Bryant, and I'm sure that the Tory boys would be quick to denounce the contents of Unfinished Victory, written in 1940. They'd call it un-British if they ever took note of what this book actually contains. Number seven, generally, the counter-jihad will not talk about deeper causes of the issue. Uh, they will not talk about spiritual elements. A large aspect of counter-jihad is a focus on the ephemera of current events and the channeling of anger towards specific parties and or individuals. Let's say the Labour Party in the UK, for example, or somebody like Ash Sakar. What you do not typically see them talking about is what might have led us to this place culturally and spiritually. The analysis, at most, might acknowledge the role of establishment elites, for example, in stitching up somebody like Enoch Powell at the height of his popularity. But it will give no hint as to why this happened. The best you will get is something like Douglas Murray writing generally about how there's a feeling that Europe is tired. But he will seldom do more than simply gesture towards the problem. And number eight, it will garner lots of mainstream media attention, whether positive or negative. Finally, the figures of counter-jihad will be controversial. They'll soak up column inches. They'll become established as household names, whether to be vilified by the media on the left or else as a talking point for Johnny Pleb uh, to, you know, talk about how they've been misunderstood and are speaking the truth. What is crucial to grasp, however, is that these figures are accepted into the wider political discourse of the nation as it is represented by mainstream media. There are no right-wing positions beyond counter-jihad, according to the discourse. The options are becoming a screamy, loony lefty, like Owen Jones, becoming a more sensible Blairite on the centre-left, becoming a more sensible Tory boy on the centre-right, or becoming a screaming bigot like Katie Hopkins. That's your political compass. And anyone with half a brain cell should be able to see that 
this is a trap. Let's say a sandwich trap that has been laid. This is a media fiction. Of course, that political compass doesn't even come close to exhausting the range of possible positions that somebody could take in 2021. And it comes nowhere near close to establishing the position of any of us on the so-called dissident right. All right, that'll do. Let me know what you think in the show notes and I'll see you again. I'm delighted to be launching the second part of the Trivium, Foundations of Logic. This will help anyone who is regularly in the habit of making arguments, whether at work, for study, for example, in essays, or just in the cut and thrust of everyday life. We are surrounded by arguments. We are surrounded by people making truth claims about the world. And logic gives you the tools to analyze and assess those claims while also ensuring that your own arguments are sharp and on point. And I know a lot of you want that. Foundations of Logic is a very traditional course drawing chiefly from the tradition of Aristotle, which was inherited and built upon by the medieval scholastic logicians and carried forward into the 19th century and the 20th centuries by many a schoolmaster and university don. Unfortunately, this system of logic that had endured for over 2,000 years largely fell into disuse over the course of the past 100 years, which is a great shame because despite its seemingly arcane and obscure looking diagrams and mnemonic formulations, it has tremendous practical use and it would be of advantage for anyone to learn. Of all of the courses that I have produced, this one is particularly exciting for me because it gets underneath the very order of thought itself. The tools of logic are a BS shredder. They will detect any flaw in an argument's terms, for example, unclear definitions. They will zero in on any false assumptions made in the premises of an argument, and they will expose errors in the chain of reasoning itself. This course should teach you how to do all of that. Furthermore, Foundations of Logic includes discussion of over 60 fallacies, both formal and informal, which, while often misused by those who have merely skimmed Wikipedia articles and in internet debates of all kinds, in the hands of someone who is trained in the fundamentals of logic, they will help you locate with pinpoint precision any errors or dirty tricks an interlocutor is trying to pull. If anyone still bothers to listen to politicians or watch mainstream news, you might struggle to go even 60 seconds without witnessing a fallacy of some kind. Everyone will benefit from increasing their knowledge of logic and practicing logic on the arguments of others and on their own arguments. Foundations of Logic is available now for £150. Don't waste your time watching Netflix during lockdown. Buy Foundations of Logic instead and give your brain a workout. Hope you enjoy the course. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out.